people were stretched and the windows were stretched. I was knocked out cold. My first thought was I was actually going to die. I really couldn't see anything. It was just horrible. Lights went out, people were screaming. Breaking the carriage windows with bare hands. And at that stage, I knew something pretty big had happened. This wasn't just me. Just weeks after the first suicide bombings in Britain, those who survived the blasts on the London Underground and on the number 30 bus told their shocking stories. I know what a bomb blast sounds like. It's not a car backfiring. It's a very, very visceral feel. It's absolutely deafening sound, very deep, loud noise. I thought, oh my God, this is another one. I woke up with my head on my knees and realized there was something in my mouth, which was my tooth. Now, one year on, we revisit those whose lives were shattered in the attacks that shocked the nation. Every time I see those two trains together, I'm taken back to July the 7th. There'll always be a little bit of my heart that's missing, and, and that's those 52 people and those 52 families. How could people born in Britain kill themselves and their fellow citizens in cold blood? There are other people out there who are willing to do the same thing. There's no getting away from this. The hard lessons, the harrowing and heartfelt stories, 7-7, seven, seven, one year on. Queen Mary's Gardens in London's Regent's Park, a serene setting for a service of remembrance for the 52 people who died in the mayhem of the 7-7 seven, seven terror attacks. Regent's Park is a place with really positive uh, memories for me after the bombing. It was a place that was very central to my recovery. A university professor in media studies, John Tullock found himself at the center of the story on July the 7th. It's not often you're on the inside of the story, the subject of attention. And this time it was me. He was sat within a meter of the suicide bomber who killed himself and seven others on a circle line train at Edgware Road. A short walk from the gardens where people will gather to remember those lost. It's not just marking the respect of the people who did lose their lives and the people who've had to go through so much change because of it. It's an opportunity for us all to come together and say, this isn't on. We can't accept, you know, a country where this happens and we need to do something about it. Telecommunications manager Lisa French cheated death on the number 30 bus. She had followed the bomber upstairs. We are fairly confident that, yes, Haseeb and I got on the bus at the same time and I followed him up the stairs. So that's quite a scary thought, really. Just 18 years old, Hasib Hussein was the youngest of the four London bombers. A second-generation Briton born in Leeds, known as a relatively quiet student. His family described him as a loving, normal man who gave them no concern. Just as bewildering as the story of the man thought to have led the terror gang, Mohammed Sadiq Khan, also born in Leeds, the married father and teaching assistant, was highly regarded by parents and teachers. He helped underprivileged youth and children who struggled at school. Also born in Britain to Pakistani parents, Shazad Tanweer was a sports science graduate and, according to an uncle, proud to be British. The fourth bomber was an outsider. Jamaican-born Jermaine Lindsay came from a broken home. A Muslim convert, he left a pregnant wife and a young son. But how could a father of two deliberately go out to kill and maim and shatter other families. In one of a series of reports on 7-7, authorities admit they're concerned that the radicalization of British citizens is not fully understood. Well, it's a gradual pro process. It doesn't happen overnight. You don't wake up one day and say, today I'm a terrorist and I'm going to plant a bomb and kill people. It, it usually takes months or years. Professor Andrew Silk has written three books on terrorism. He's not surprised that four apparently intelligent and caring people became the first homegrown suicide bombers in Britain. We need to remember that 
any war situation, you can get soldiers on, on, on both sides who are, who are willing to die for the cause and are also willing to kill for the cause. And we don't assume that soldiers are crazy or mad. They see themselves as soldiers and that's a key, to, key way into their psychology. They believe they are the good guys and that's something that we often find very, very difficult. Indeed, months after he killed himself and seven others, the former teaching assistant who cared for underprivileged kids appeared on a pre-recorded video, transformed into a fierce and vengeful soldier. We are at war and I'm a soldier. Now you too will taste the reality of this situation. The transformation of Mohammed Sadiq Khan and his accomplices also plays on the minds of their victims. Now we've got to understand more about the cause. It doesn't justify it, but it's trying to understand it. I feel very strongly that, you know, these young Muslim boys, they didn't have a good role model. If they were looking for a role model, the only role model they found was someone who would persuade them to commit terrorism. Influence or direction is just a part of the radicalization process that terror experts liken to the making of a bomb. When you combine them together, you get a very, very dangerous mix. For the 7-7 bombers, the ingredients or conditions for radicalization were all too apparent. They had all developed a strong sense of identity, in this case as devout Muslims. They worked together as a tight group. Family and friends were excluded. They had influence and direction. Intelligence reports say it's likely that at least two of the bombers met Al-Qaeda figures on trips to Pakistan or Afghanistan. Crucial. All are thought to have been motivated by an intense sense of persecution and injustice against fellow Muslims. It's a controversial point for Britain and its coalition allies, but experts like Andrew Silk are convinced that the war in Iraq was significant. Iraq does play a role, it does help radicalize people, and it's gonna to continue to help radicalize people, and, and we need to accept that. Using widely available commercial ingredients and advice from the internet or an experienced bomb maker, the gang of four were ready for their personal jihad each armed with two to five kilogram bombs. Return from the River Kwai and the powerful documentary The Bridge on the River Kwai. National Geographic Channel's Fact on Film. Tomorrow from 9. If you hit me at 40 miles an hour, there's around an 80% chance I'll die. Something for everyone during the home base sale. This Barcelona mosaic tile top table and four chairs is under £200. Or what about this beautiful Winchester teak set under £550? That's because all garden furniture is up to half price. And if you use our spend and save loyalty card, you can earn up to 10% back in vouchers. Home base. Make a house a home. Now you can learn French in just a week without even picking up a book. The Mail are giving away absolutely free nine hour-long Linguaphone CDs that build into a complete Teach Yourself French course. Tu as choisi? No books, no writing. Disc 1 is free inside tomorrow's Daily Mail. Tu me passe la journée? Non, c'est lui Disc 2 is free inside the Mail on Sunday. Collect the CDs on offer every day and you could be speaking French. Ton profil, chérie. This time next week. Le Daily Mail, s'il vous plaît. Sorry. Starting in tomorrow's Daily Mail. Bigger in the hot up now, as how was that for you coming from the stand side, followed by Wheezy Boy on the rails, and it... Chop shot. Oh, it's a penalty. They're really pushing forward. So ask, ask just a higher heel. If you've got chunky legs, always wear a higher heel and just go through the pain. These ones, going out of shoot. You're bad. No housewife telly, no nonsense. John Smith's. Only Frontline Spot On provides long-lasting protection for both cats and dogs against fleas and ticks. Frontline Spot On, the gesture of love you can trust.
Mr. Sheen multi-purpose spray and wipes. For an astonishingly shiny sheen. Mr. Sheen shines some teeth that's clean. Get a short break with school summer holidays from £65 per person. Call free on 0800 20 30 40. Haven, the great family get-together. The Naval Criminal Investigative Service. The real NCIS. If you think you know them from the hit series on 5 and FX, then think again. Because National Geographic Channel has been given unprecedented access to film behind the scenes as they train, investigate crime, and counter terrorism in the world's flashpoints. <laughs> Real NCIS, coming soon to National Geographic Channel. The terror attack that authorities said was inevitable arrived on the day that London was celebrating its winning bid to host the 2012 Olympics. It was also the day G8 leaders met in Scotland and the original trial date of extremist Muslim cleric Abu Hamza on charges of soliciting murder and inciting hatred. A government report would conclude there was no evidence that the attacks were linked to any particular event. But another report by the Cross-Party Intelligence and Security Committee would reveal that both Sadiq Khan and fellow bomber Shahzad Tanweer were known to the security services well before July the 7th. They were not investigated or followed. There were other more pressing priorities. Those priorities have not been made public. Other more important leads were being followed, and that's it. We, we will never know what they were. Were they real? Were they f false? Were they mislead? Full-time surveillance of, a, of one person takes about 20 police officers. Or, so as a result, they have, to, they have to discriminate over who is worth following and keeping under tight surveillance and who isn't such a serious threat. They obviously got it wrong to the can. So they've had to deal with anything on this scale before. The gang covered its tracks, but there were subtle signs for a train die. They built their bombs in a rented flat. The peroxide chemicals they used had a strong bleaching effect that turned their hair lighter. The fumes killed off plants outside the windows. Yet they completed their mission. It's estimated to have cost around 8,000 pounds, including everything from travel to Pakistan or Afghanistan, to the relatively cheap and easy to get chemicals they needed to make four, two to five kilogram bombs, plus other devices they left behind. terrifying that you know four ordinary boys could take that information get everything they need and commit that crime that they did and for us to find that undetectable for them to just be able to go about that and it not cause any alert or any alarm anywhere for them to get that far and actually get to the execution stage it's terrifying on the morning of July the 7th, with the bombs on their backs, the four met at Luton Station for their last train to London, King's Cross Station. It's thought they planned to fan out across the network on crowded rush hour trains and simultaneously detonate their bombs at 8.50 a.m. They were probably led by Sadiq Khan. He boarded a westbound Circle Line train second carriage from the front. He was joined at the next station by university professor John Tullock. This was John's first interview, conducted just weeks after the bombing. I was in a rush. I had to get that train at 9.15 to Cardiff. I had that that afternoon and the next day to get finished a chapter for a book on risk and everyday life. That was going to be my day. The second bomber, Shazad Tanweer, would board a train that would take him in the opposite direction on the circle line going east. He pushed his way down the busy platform, getting in the third carriage from the front. At Liverpool Street Station, two of Britain's top dancers would join Tanweer in the same carriage. Bruce Late and Crystal Main were commuting to London to rehearse for the Strictly Ballroom dancing show. 
you know, we just got the part in the show and everything was great. So everything, life was good at that point in time. We walked on and sat on the opposite side next to the double doors. On the Piccadilly line, a few stops north of King's Cross, secretary and mother of two, Hazel Chules, had settled into her daily ritual of trying to ignore the peak hour crush. You couldn't lift your arms up or anything. It was so busy and packed. So I couldn't read the newspaper. So I decided just to close my eyes. Waiting ahead at King's Cross Station, the two remaining bombers, Jermaine Lindsay and Hasib Hussein, were yet to get on a tube. What are we going to do now? An Islamist website would claim that the Gang of Four planned to fan out north, south, east and west in the pattern of a cross. If so, the northerly arm of the cross was blocked. Northern Line trains were suspended due to a derailment. It was only minutes away from the bomber's deadline of 8.50. Back at King's Cross, Jermaine Lindsay left Hasib Hussein and made his way into the front of the packed Piccadilly line train and the carriage next to Secretary Hazel Chules. Um, and I thought, I'm really squeezed against the door and the glass. So I'll just close my eyes and wait until I get to Holborn. It's only two stops and I'll, I'll be there. It was almost 8.50 a.m. Three of the four bombers were on board their chosen trains. But one of them had yet to find a target. 18-year-old Hasib Hussein wandered in and out of King's Cross Station. He would try to call the other three on his mobile phone. Back underground, there were just moments to go. University professor and author John Tullock had moved nearer to the door for a fast exit at the next station. At Edgware Road, an unusual number of people got out. And um, the guy next to me got out, so I moved along to the end of the seat. He had moved to within one metre of Sadiq Khan. Back on the Piccadilly line, only an emergency door separated Hazel Chules from the carriage carrying Jermaine Lindsay. In three separate tube trains, lives were about to be shattered. Quite packed in, and I, I sort of overcome being actually the feeling of being um, claustrophobic. I just sat there, opened the paper, got my head down to read the paper. I began to push myself up to my feet, uh, and fortunately I didn't. I decided, no, this is too far from Paddington, and I just sat down again. And then it happened. It was sudden and instant, and the stretched, you know, people were stretched, and the windows were stretched. And I was knocked out cold. At 8.51, the network control centre recorded a problem. Above ground, there were questions about a possible explosion. Below ground was chaos. I opened my eyes and smoke and the smell of burning and such filled the whole of the carriage. I don't know if I was unconscious at all, but the next thing was I was sort of on my back in a darkened carriage. Uh, my glasses had gone, couldn't see much. Um, I could feel a lot of wet on my face, uh, which I assumed was blood. Uh, I knew something pretty bad had happened to me. Three minutes after the explosions, amid growing confusion, the London Underground decided it had an emergency to deal with. But there was no adequate underground communication system, a system that should have been installed after the King's Cross fire 18 years before. Above ground, commuters were unaware of the horrors unfolding beneath their feet. Trapped in wrecked carriages below, some survivors took pictures with their mobile phones. 
I know that the carriage that I was in actually derailed because you could hear with everyone moving around, you could hear like creaking metal. And I glanced around, I couldn't, I couldn't see any further into the carriage. It was really dark and just full of smoke, just full of smoke. I rolled to my left because the two people I'd heard talking were the nearest to me. One was slumped like me over the remains of the seat. The other was lying on the floor. I think they were moaning. I'm not sure if they tried to talk to me. I heard a sound, but I, they were covered in blood. They were like me. And at that stage, I knew something pretty big had happened. This wasn't just me. It looked like um, a butcher's shop down there. Nine minutes after three blasts on three separate lines, London Underground received another report of smoke and passengers walking along the track at Edgware Road. Operators called the fire brigade. On the bombed circle line train beneath Aldgate, Bruce Late's first thought was for his girlfriend, Crystal Main. I said, are you OK, Crystal? Are you all right? And she said, I, 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 don't, I don't know. So, and I, at that point, I thought to myself, well, am I, am I OK? And then I, I tried to move my legs, and I realised there was a, somebody lying on top of me as well. And um, I thought, well, I can't move my legs because this lady was quite heavy, and there were pieces of metal and wreckage in between her body and me. The force of the blast had blown two women down the carriage and onto the couple. I looked down to the lady on top of me, and because I didn't know if she was alive or dead, and I remember her twitching and making a, a breathing sound. And I, I looked, I looked down at her, and she was. Um, she was not moving, apart from the odd twitch, every minute or so. And, I, and that said to me, well, she's still alive. I'm not going to try and move her off me or anything like that because, you know, I, I don't know if, that's, if that would kill her or not. I don't know. So I decided to stay completely still and wait for the paramedics to come along. Deep below ground on the Piccadilly line, conditions were unbearable. People started panicking. <laughs> And, and saying to smash the windows, to get out, smash the windows, and other people were screaming not to, not to smash the windows because um, the smoke had come in, more smoke had come in. You, could, you couldn't breathe, everyone's eyes were stinging. It would be 20 minutes before ambulances were called to the Piccadilly line. A London Assembly investigation into the rescue would highlight poor communications and a lack of medical supplies that left victims and rescuers stranded. News had yet to emerge of the explosion at Edgware Road. In his first interview only weeks later, John Tullock explained how he survived, despite being just a metre away from the bomber. The thing I was most aware of was not, at that point, dead bodies or wrecked carriage. I was focusing on my body, and my legs were f good, and my torso seemed good. One year on, it's not only his brush with death on the circle line that haunts him, but the ordeal suffered by other victims on the Piccadilly line. I can't even get on Piccadilly line trains. I can get on circle line trains, which was what I was on that day. But Piccadilly line, I was in a, a train, same sort of bomb. Seven died in that train, 26 died. Why? Because those trains fit the tunnel so tight. There's no way for the explosion to go back, set back in. Survivors trapped amid the carnage on the Piccadilly line were on their own for a full half hour until help finally arrived. The message came through from the other carriage that they were going, the rescue services had started to get everybody off the train and they were actually going to come and they'd reach us and they were going to rescue us. Um, Obviously, everybody panicked because everybody just surged for the door. People that were sitting on the chairs behind me suddenly stood up, and the gentlemen on the carriage um, that were immediately around me just said, just took control basically, and said for everybody to sit down, to sit down. And they, you know, as soon as the rescue services arrived, they let everybody off. So we all held hands and just walked into the next carriage. The carriage had actually been derailed, so the rails were clearly showing. And then, sorry. I realised it was actually a body. 
and um, but he actually had no legs. And I don't know what I was thinking at that time. I just couldn't you know, make any sense of it. And what if we'd crashed? Why was an owl body, you know, laying in the in the tunnel? Rescuers who braved horrific conditions would be praised for their efforts. But the London Ambulance Service was overwhelmed. There was a lack of stretchers and other equipment. One paramedic would later describe running to a shop to get extra bandages. Rescuers couldn't use their radios underground, and mobile phone networks were swamped. Some of the critically injured wouldn't make it, like the passenger blown on top of trapped survivor, Bruce Late. The wait for the paramedics after the explosion, it seemed like forever. It seemed like we were sitting there waiting and waiting and there were people walking past behind us and they were all okay and there was us sitting there waiting and waiting and waiting. I noticed that the lady on top of me had stopped moving. I don't know if that's the moment she died or not because she was actually still already at that point. But I remember thinking at the time, this lady is not going to survive. There's nothing I can do about it. It was quite hard. In the rush to save lives, some of the walking wounded emerging from the underground were overlooked. In many cases, people needing treatment for trauma and shock were left to fend for themselves. Volunteers played a vital role, like part-time fireman Paul Dadge, who set up a first aid post in a department store. I decided, uh, probably instinct really, to speak to Marks and Spencers, advise them we need to set up a casualty uh, RVP, a rendezvous point, and move these casualties into that area. The photograph of Paul Dadge with Burns' victim, Davinia Turrell, became one of the defining images of July the 7th. At Edgware Road, rescuers finally reached John Tullock's bombed carriage 45 minutes after the blast. A photograph taken as he emerged from the tube was seen around the world. One year on, he's still concussed and suffering head injuries, but considers himself fortunate. A feelings of amazing good luck. My cases, because I just came back from Australia, which certainly saved my legs, which I'd only just moved seconds before the blast. My glasses were blown away, but they must have stayed there long enough to stop shrapnel going in my eyes. I've got shrapnel marks all over the rest of my face. And people further away died. On July 7th, security services had been on standby in case of trouble at the G8 summit in Scotland. The terror attacks that took them by surprise in London were not over. The fourth and youngest bomber in the gang was still looking for a target. Serengeti, Stampede of the Mega Herd. Tomorrow at 7 on National Geographic Channel. Life's full of annoying little things, but diarrhea doesn't need to be one of them. Choose Imodium Instants. They dissolve instantly on your tongue, so you can be free from diarrhea all day. Take Imodium. Take control. Taffy thinks there's something in my bath. He's gone bonkers for the chunks of fish in his bowl. <laughs> but it makes me laugh and laugh when he sniffs round that plug hole. New whiskers, oh so fishy, with whole chunks of fish. Get your skates on because Citroen prices are frozen this month. A roomy Berlingo multi spas from just $7,995. Or the Zara Picasso from just $8,995. A C4 that's alive with technology from just $9,195. And on selected Berlingo, Zara Picasso, and C4 models, typical 0% APR with 35% deposit. Cool Citroen deals. Save up to $4,645 this month.
Observer Woman magazine. This Sunday in the Observer. My mum says you are what you eat. So, can you eat French fries? You'll become French? Yep. And if you run a beans, you'll become a runner? Yep. And if you eat, what's this then? It's green giant sweet corn. Green giant? Green Giant Sweet Corn is full of natural goodness and one of your recommended five-a-day fruit and vegetables. Ho, ho, ho. Green Giant! The common mayfly has a life expectancy of just one day. But is he miserable about it? Not one bit. He fills his day with the things he loves. He savours every moment. Just think, if we embraced life like the Mayfly, what a life that would be. Vodafone, make the most of now. Telecommunications team manager Lisa French still makes the occasional business trip to London. But it was on this beach that she realised how lucky she was to return home to her family after July the 7th. I think over time it's, it's sunk on actually yeah. you know, how lucky I really, really am to be here. To realise that you're, you're still together and every day is a gift and it's a day that you may not have had together. Um, you know, we had our second wedding anniversary this year and that was so special to have that day when it could easily, you know, have been taken away from us. On July 7th, Lisa French was one of thousands of commuters whose travel plans were thrown into chaos around King's Cross Station. Emergency services were battling to cope with a crisis that would only get worse. Three young Muslim men had blown themselves up on three London Underground trains. Dozens have been killed and many hundreds more injured. The capital's transport system ground to a halt. Lisa French recalled her fateful journey that morning in her first interview, just weeks later. As I got to the main concourse in, in King's Cross and made my way to the underground, entrance uh, there were a couple of stewards and a couple of policemen um, and there was a small crowd at the top of the stairs and um, they were directing people explaining that there was some kind of problem um, downstairs also trying to find a way to get to work in north london was australian louise barry i came to england on a two-year working visa um, for the opportunity to work and live in another country and travel europe also destined to head into the chaos that morning was charity worker Anat Rosenberg, seen here on a home video with her partner John Falding. Concerned at suicide bombings in her native Israel, she felt safer living in London. When the alarm clock went off that morning, it would be the last time the pair would wake up together. When she woke, she said, I'm tired. Can you reset it? So I set it for 20 past and eventually she roused herself but was running late as usual and was too rushed to have any breakfast and for once i think probably the only time when she was leaving here um she didn't look back and wave she just rushed down the stairs and that was late for work the tube network was shutting down joining a crowd of commuters she made her way to euston to catch a bus also in the crowd, apparently relaxed and unhurried at first, was the last of the four London bombers, Hasib Hussein. He repeatedly tried to call his three accomplices, but the lines were dead. It's thought he may have bought a nine-volt battery, possibly needed to detonate his bomb. He went in and out of a McDonald's and was reportedly seen on a number 91 bus looking nervous. At this time, news of the emergency underground was spreading. Catherine was inside the station, has been evacuated from it and is on the line to us now. Uh, Catherine, just tell us what happened. Alert calls were going out to accident and emergency doctors like Jim Ryan. It must be about 10 past nine when my colleague rang me and said, I don't know what's happening, but something is. Get your butt over here. Stranded commuters were calling home. 
Annette phoned me on her mobile about five or ten minutes later. She said, well, you know, it's very crowded here outside Euston. I said, well, it would be. I'd just seen on the television that they, they've closed the station. I said, tell you what, go back one stop and jump the queue, get on a bus there. And so I could imagine exactly where she would have been sitting. For those travelling north, the number 30 bus was a good alternative to the tube. Australian Louise Barry boarded the same bus at the same stop as Anat Rosenberg. Because it was quite empty, I went and sat at the very back left-hand corner of the bus. Louise Barry and Anat Rosenberg were sitting just a few seats apart at the back of the bus. The next stop was Euston Station. By this time, the underground network had been evacuated. Waiting in the crowd was the fourth bomber, Hasid Hussein, who had probably got off one bus and was about to catch another. As he boarded the number 30 bus, he probably pushed past Lisa French. And one of those people did have a large um, rucksack, which I noticed they had to take off their shoulder to get round me with my laptop bag. Somebody said that there were a few seats upstairs, the downstairs of the bus was full. So the person with the bag and myself made the, our way up the stairs. Um, I noticed there was a seat left in the middle um, on my right-hand side, which I presumed he would take, and there were also a couple of seats at the back. Um, he made his way all the way to the back of the bus. One year on, Lisa French remains haunted by the memory. I don't know. I, I just wish I'd been able to do something. But of course, back on that morning, neither Lisa nor anyone else could have guessed that the young man fiddling with his rucksack was a suicide bomber. Amid the traffic chaos, the bus was diverted south towards Tavistock Square. Coincidentally, accident and emergency doctor Jim Ryan was being called to a hospital in the same area. I walked up Tottenham Court Road and up into the hospital. And, uh, getting phone calls all the time from Eddie McGuinness, my colleagues, saying yes, something is happening. It was a build-up of interesting. First of all, something's happening, we don't know what it is. Then something, something is happening, we think it's been a, a, an, accident, an accident with um, power plant in the underground, uh, and there's been some explosions. Then it's probably a terrorist bomb, then it's probably two. Passengers on the number 30 bus were also getting alarming news about explosions on the underground. I get a text from my boyfriend saying, they were bombs, lucky you weren't involved. A few seats away, Annette Rosenberg made another call to her partner, John Falding. She was always very interested in my work as chairman of the St. Marlborough Society, concerned with local issues, and in particular, um, the amount of fire cover in the area. And she thought that this would be an item for the society's newsletter. As soon as she said newsletter, I heard unworldly screams in the background. Um, and after a couple of seconds, her mobile went dead. I know, what, I know what a bomb blast sounds like. It's not a car backfiring. It's a very, very visceral feel. I thought, oh my god. Uh, this is another one. 18 year old Hasib Hussein blew himself and the bus apart, directly opposite the British Medical Association. Surgeon Mohib Khan was one of the first on the scene. There was absolutely deafening sound, very deep, loud uh, noise. And in fact, you know, the, this building felt like, you know, sh shook the building. And I straight away said um, to my colleague, the bomb has gone off. There was a shout from the main gate, uh, we need doctors, we need doctors. And uh, so uh, three of us from, from this committee, all three surgeons, uh, went out uh, outside the gate and saw this absolute carnage. I don't remember anything 
of the blast at all. Um, I woke up with my head on my knees and in my mouth, which was my tooth, um, and I spat that out. In front of us almost looked normal. People's seats were still intact, people were standing up. When we turned and looked behind us, the bus just dropped away behind us. There were literally three inches of floor before it, it bent down. Lisa French was lucky to survive. The explosion had blown the roof off and pushed the rear of the upper deck down onto those sitting below. Crushed beneath the upper deck was Louise Barry. I was completely um, bent forward where my head ended up between my knees and the, the roof or the floor of the double deck of the roof of the bus ended up on my head as well as what felt like something from behind also fell. So something felt like it had dropped down from above and from behind and I was basically just trapped in my seat in the very back corner of the bus with the bus on top of me. Louise Barry was trapped in the wreckage, but Lisa French found an escape route. A gentleman stuck his head through the, the stairwell and said, you know, is there anybody left up there? Um, and he rattled a bit of metal that was covering the top of the stairwell and he said, you know, lift this, you can get down through here. Um, so we just climbed over seats and people's bags and things and just climbed out the side of the bus. There were twisted metal all over. There were body parts on the floor. Some people were dead, lying on the pavement. Um, one body which I um, saw, there was no, um, no, you know, arms or legs or head. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, just open abdomen, and uh, there was a horrific scene that completely stunned me for um, a few seconds. I did not know where to start. This, I did not know which patient, which one I should go first. They're all needing equal help. The University College Hospital was closest to the blast, and it was not only doctors who volunteered to help, as Jim Ryan explained at the scene. Huge response, even to the extent of our colleagues who are on the building site just beside us, uh, the workers coming over, offering to donate blood. But rescue would be slow for those trapped with horrific injuries. I'm still trapped in the wreckage, and I've got a girl next to me, and I've also got a girl in front of me who's been facing me, so I can feel their legs, although I can't feel any life as such. Um, so I immediately knew exactly where I was. I could see what felt like a bit of light, daylight outside, so I immediately crawled down between my legs and their legs and crawled out. By the time I got down on the ground, it was co completely covered in glass and I could see, obviously I could see bits of body parts and limbs and people all around me on the ground and a, a complete sea of broken glass and I was obviously still in shock but somehow I managed to pull my mobile phone out, call my boyfriend. I was completely hysterical saying there's been a bomb on the bus, there's been a bomb on the bus, I, I can't feel my neck, my neck hurts, my neck hurts and I just lay down on the side of the road. The courtyard of the British Medical Association was turned into a field hospital. Reporters who rushed to Tavistock Square confirmed the worst. As, uh, as everybody is saying to me, we can't go down to the tubes, we can't walk up the street, where on earth do we go? It appeared that nowhere in London was safe. At Tavistock Square, doctors were helped by volunteers, like Stephanie riak -Akue. I came across a woman, I later found out her name was Louise. I remember specifically one lady with long dark hair looking at me and telling me I was going to be okay and putting towels under my head temporarily until they could get me a neck brace or until we could actually get the neck brace on. I remember I was about to cry. I remember her looking at me. And she seemed so distressed and I just looked at her body. Her legs were covered with a blanket but I saw her torso that there wasn't a scratch. And I just looked in her eyes and I said, everything will be all right. You've survived. 
you're alive, you're not gonna die, and everything's okay. And at that moment, she just burst into tears. More than an hour after she dragged herself from the wreckage of the bus, Louise Barry was finally taken to hospital. The doctors were amazing. Everybody was loving, caring, kind. I can't really, you know, I can't speak any more highly than everyone there. She had a fracture to her neck and a deep wound in her leg. In that wound, doctors found debris and a vital piece of evidence. I was whisked off again for an emergency operation on my legs and they found the toggle to the bomb in my leg. So the actual bit that comes that they take off the top of the bomb was wedged in my leg, um, along with other bits and pieces. Later that morning, news reports confirmed there had been a coordinated terror attack on London. 52 people who had left home only hours before would never return. They said it was a number 30. This is where it would have been. The time was the same, and the screams that I'd heard, and the fact that she didn't come back to me. I think I knew then. Annette Rosenberg was later confirmed as one of the 13 people murdered on the number 30 bus. 39 others were killed in the three tube explosions. The attack that authorities had warned would happen one day had come. Thoughts and prayers, of course, are with the victims and their families. It is just indiscriminate attempt at mass murder. But for intelligence authorities, the full shock was yet to come. Police opened a phone line for families worried about loved ones who were missing. Of more than 100,000 calls received, there was one they weren't expecting from a house in Leeds. Yes, yes. I'm worried about my son. He's been down to London. It was from the mother of 18-year-old Hasib Hussein. She told police he'd been missing since going to London with friends the previous evening. When Hussein's body was identified at the scene of the bus explosion and those of his friends at the London Underground blasts, the startling fact emerged. London had been bombed by homegrown terrorists. After almost 2,000 years, what if a secret about one of these dinner guests was revealed? A secret that could change religious history and may challenge our deepest beliefs. Judas Iscariot's Gospel. Gospel of Judas, Sunday at 9 on National Geographic Channel. Now you can learn French in just a week without even picking up a book. The Mail are giving away absolutely free nine hour-long Linguaphone CDs that build into a complete Teach Yourself French course. Tu as choisi? No books, no writing. Disc 1 is free inside tomorrow's Daily Mail. Tu me passes la journée. Non, c'est le mien. Disc 2 is free inside the Mail on Sunday. Collect the CDs on offer every day and you could be speaking French. Ton pour failli, chérie. This time next week. Le Daily Mail, s'il vous plaît. Sorry. Starting in tomorrow's Daily Mail. Hey up, new neighbours. Suppose better go and say hello. Okay. You all right? So you've got the new Safari then? Yeah, brand new. Want your butchers? New car. New arms. Someone's doing all right. Glass roof. Covered storage. Sat nav. Keeps them out of trouble. My mother bought us that. Oh, oh they're, they're tired. tired. Zafira, a clever family car from Vauxhall. Fact, kitchen grease happens. So does bathroom scum. But new Dettol Multi-Action 4-in-1 powers through tough grease and bathroom dirt. And as it's Dettol, it kills 99.9% .9 of bacteria. So your home's fresh and clean. Multi-Action 4-in-1, voted product of the year. And now you can get Dettol 4-in-1 power for your floor. The highly anticipated new series is here. Hey, pal, it's a crime scene. You reap what you sow. 
a jungle out there, huh? New York's finest are back. The new series of Law and Order coming soon to the Hallmark Channel. Fixident Food Seal has a thinner nozzle which allows for precise application. This helps to give a better seal against food infiltration. Fixident Food Seal, life with more bite. Look at your eyes, light. One year on, there's been a series of internal investigations and reports into Britain's first homegrown suicide terror attack. Many survivors want a public inquiry. What has been made public is that two of the Leeds-based bombers went overseas and probably met Al-Qaeda terrorists. All three of the Leeds bombers had some kind of record before 7-7. The two who went to Pakistan were known to the security services, and agents had the phone number of the third. Why weren't they investigated? Resources had to be diverted. There were more pressing priorities. Exactly what these priorities were remains a secret. I'm certain that the head of those departments say to the government, we need more money, look at these targets, we need to track these people. And why is that money not being funded? Why is it being diverted to other things? But survivors, terror experts and governments recognize that not all terror attacks can be prevented by surveillance alone. It is a bit like shutting the door after the horse has bolted. If you've lost the hearts and minds, well then of course you're gonna to have to spend more and more money if you're chasing your tail. And so far it hasn't worked, has it? According to one estimate, there are at least a thousand pro-Al-Qaeda suspects in Britain with the potential to turn violent. Police have had a very good success rate in preventing attacks. About 95% of all the attacks have been pre prevented. Um, but that still means some get through. Um, another attack will happen. Whether it will be as bad as July, uh, we don't know. Hopefully it won't. But I think we have to accept there is nothing which has changed in the broader picture. The government claims that at least three terror plots in Britain have been thwarted in the year since July 2005. While security services battle the so-called war on terror, survivors and the loved ones of those lost on July the 7th have their own battles to fight. Of course, I often think, well, if only she'd got up at eight o'clock, but then there are so many if onlys, and throughout all of this period, I've realized that the two harshest words in the English language are if and only. Of the survivors featured in the original program, Bruce Late and Crystal Main recovered well enough to tour Britain in the Strictly Ballroom Dancing stage show. Bruce's family say he's getting on with his life, and wants to put the ordeal behind him. Hazel Chules is back at work full time, but is not using the tube anymore. Louise Barry no longer wears a neck brace and has resumed work in Australia. Lisa French has also returned to work with a vigorous and positive outlook on life. But that day in July is forever etched on her mind. You realize they, they didn't make their aim. They didn't get anything out of it. No one believes in their cause anymore. And if it can maybe, you know, open dialogue between communities where there hasn't been dialogue before and some understanding, then I hope it will. But I don't know. John Tullock, the Australian academic who received a royal visit in his hospital bed, is still having tests for head injuries. But he has written a book and continues to work to a busy university schedule. Coincidentally, it was the gardens chosen for the memorial service that played a major role in his recovery. Both my sons came over in late July. Their jobs get me outside, and the target for the end of the week they were with me was to uh, get me to walk to Regent's Park Lake. And there I was, midsummer, in the Rose Garden at, uh, at Regent's Park, and I actually was looking. So not only could I smell this, but it was a life-affirming thing, of course. 
The final toll of the 7th of July 2005 was more than 700 people injured and 52 people killed. In a city of millions, daily life has returned to normal, but for the permanently injured and the bereaved, there is no going back to normal. Their lives have changed forever.